afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. City Club is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. I'm Greg McPherson, president of City Club. Members and guests are gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel, along with all of you listening on OPB radio or watching on Portland Community Media. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners enables us to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Our media partner is Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum sponsors are AARP of Oregon, McKinley Urban, Iberdrola Renewables, Airbnb, and Uber. Please join me in showing our appreciation for all of them. <clears throat> At next week's Friday Forum, we will hear from supporters and opponents of a proposed oil terminal in Vancouver, Washington. They will discuss the benefits and risks of a project that has the potential for increasing the amount of oil moved by rail through the Columbia River Gorge. You can learn more about City Club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, we will be live tweeting today's program. You can follow along and join the conversation using the hashtag PDXCityClub. Later in today's program, the moderator will facilitate a Q&A session between our speaker and the live audience. Asking questions at the microphone is a benefit of City Club membership. But anyone in the live audience here at the Sentinel may write a question on one of the index cards found at the center of the tables. Hold the card up, card up and City Club staff will collect them before or during the Q&A session. And now for today's program. On a range of innovative transportation strategies, Portland is recognized as a national leader, from public transit investments to bicycle infrastructure to pedestrian first design. But other cities and regions are moving ahead, deploying innovative strategies and accessing new funding sources. Portland may no longer deserve its reputation for being out front on transportation. Our speaker today on this topic is David Bragdon, who has spent a long career in transportation, including a year spent driving a taxi cab. From 2003 to 2010, he served as president of Metro, the Portland area's elected regional government. He subsequently served as director of New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. David Bragdon is currently executive director of Transit Center, a nonprofit organization based in New York, working to improve public transportation across the country. He will speak first and then have a conversation with our moderator, Sarah Merck. She is the online editor at Bitch Media and hosts the feminist podcast, Popaganda. Please join me in welcoming David Bragdon and Sarah Merck to City Club. Well, 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 look at you. You haven't changed a bit. You know, I go away for five years, I get a little white hair. You all, you look exactly the same. Congratulations, it's clean living. I want to also, in terms of people who, who never change, I want to acknowledge Nancy and Paul Bragdon who are here. Thanks for the support being here. Coming back to Portland is always fun. For me, it's familiar and fresh at the same time. With a little bit of distance, you get a little perspective as well. I think about a, somebody I knew in college who won a, a fellowship to go study in New Zealand afterwards. And I asked, well, what are you, you going to be studying? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm going to study American government. I said, well, why would, why would you go to New Zealand to study American government? He said, well, you can't study that in America. You know, no perspective. A fish would be the last to discover water. And, the perspective on Portland from far away, I think, is, is really helpful. I'm lucky now to be working for a civic foundation. We're a foundation we're committed to improving urban mobility across the country. This is a time of a lot of change in that field after four or five decades of pretty much stasis, where transportation was provided by large bureaucracies, slow moving. There's a tremendous amount of dynamism in the world right now, a lot of it in the private sector, but a lot of it in the public sector as well. We fund studies, we commission work directly, we do grant making to universities and civic groups around the country. There's a couple of pieces of work that I really want to draw on today. One is on the topic of governance, which sounds really boring, and I apologize for that, but it counts for a lot. It's not government, which is a thing, it's governance, which is how institutions relate to each other, how decisions get made, where there's cooperation, where there's not. This came up in part because of a dilemma they were facing in Chicago, 
among many other things that they were facing, that the vast job growth scattered around the suburbs and the people needing jobs in the south side of Chicago and the inability of them to connect on transit. And this was originally framed as, well, this is an operations problem. And the think tank that we, we, uh, we commissioned to do this work did a few interviews and, and quickly concluded this is actually not an operations problem. The operations people could fix this in one meeting or maybe two meetings. It's really a problem of the fact that the CTA is controlled by the mayor and PACE in the suburbs is controlled by the collar counties. And those individuals weren't talking to each other. There wasn't cooperation. So the operations people couldn't actually do their job because of this governance issue. And we, we found a lot of different governing structures around the country, some on how they work. And I have some perspective on how Oregon functions in that way too and how it compares to other places. The other work that I'm really drawing on is one that does feature Portland. It's called A People's History of Recent Transportation Innovation, in which we looked at this phenomena that's happening around the country. And Ted's quite right. So much of this started here. But in terms of taking back the streets for people, pedestrian plazas, biking, green infrastructure for stormwater management, the idea that streets are for more than just moving cars as quickly as possible. And we asked the question, given that transportation is generally a fairly routinized, bureaucratized undertaking, how did these changes occur? We're really interested in change and how change can come about in that type of circumstance. And what we found, we, we profiled six cities, so it's Portland, Chicago, New York, Charlotte, Denver, Pittsburgh, and what we found is, despite the diversity of those cities, very different cases in each type, you know, geographically, demographics, something they had in common, to, uh, entirely in common, is that in every case, change originated outside the conventional institutions of the transportation establishment. It started with citizens. And that case was most stark here in Portland. Portland's the first chapter in the book, and rightfully so with the, the, the civic activists, whether it's the AIA chapter downtown, who eventually became the downtown plan, people in Southeast Portland trying to preserve their neighborhoods and fighting the Mount Hood Freeway, and taking back their, the city in that sense, long before the elected officials had caught on, and long before the agencies had also caught on. What we find is it takes an, a, an elected leader to actually grasp those things and actually make, make them happy, and that's, and make them happen, and that's certainly the case here. So quite rightly, Portland is the first chapter in that book, chronologically, because it happened here first. There's a lot of momentum from the good things that have happened here in the past. Just last month, the Orange Line opened. There's good celebrations around that, and there should be. And just to give you a national perspective on that, TriMet is a national model in terms of project delivery, in terms of design. The workforce here is also a national model. I was talking to a federal official last week who covers the Southwest and Texas and so on, and he tells the agencies in his part of the country, if you want to understand project delivery, you have to go see how TriMet does it. When you think about this, just by comparison, you have Gresham, 86, the Hillsboro uh, in, in 98, Interstate, the airport, Clackamas, and now uh, Milwaukee, everyone, with the exception of the tunnel under the hills, which is a geologic factor nobody could have seen, without exception, they've delivered each of those on time and under budget. That's very rare, actually, in, in the industry. TriMet's also a leader in open data, uh, involving people in the operations in terms of opening their data and fair payment. So there's a lot for Portland to be proud of in all this. And you should take pride in it, but don't be complacent about it. Because as I said, a lot of places are emulating it, and here comes the tough love part. There's some places that are actually outpacing Portland right now and doing a lot. And let me tell you a little bit about those. Denver, Denver, Colorado, in the last 10 years has invested $5.5 billion in transit. That's like a Milwaukee line every other year or so. They have multiple lines under construction at the same time. Every year they've been improving the bus service, doing more of that. Last month, Mayor Hancock proposed an 18% increase in the transportation budget for the streets, to improve streets, for biking, walking, to, to, to speed up transit. This is part of their economic competitiveness strategy to attract people. They're also leveraging the investment they made in flood controls along the creeks to create a regional trail network pretty quickly. Now, when Mike Wetter started the intertwine, he did the whole, that whole calculation about, we have a plan here in the Portland area about our trail network. 
you know, I did the calculation, well, how long will it take to build it out at the current rate? I think the estimate at that time was 190 years. So not very fast. That's, of course, that's five years ago, so now it's 185. But still, Los Angeles, a place that often we lampoon as the, the, where car is king. Mayor Garcetti is reclaiming those big arterials. He's created a great streets program. He's got a skunk works of architects and designers in his own office, independent of the city DOT, because they weren't moving fast enough. He created a little unit in his own group to redesign those streets. They've rezoned areas and, and put things in the zoning code to re reduce parking requirements, all types of things that would have been unheard of in Los Angeles just five years ago. On the transit side, they have a capital plan of 45 billion, it's billion with a B, in terms of, of their, their, their transit system. So this is happening everywhere. It's not red, blue state, it's happening everywhere. The place that has built more rail than any place else in this country over the last 15 years is Salt Lake City. Of course, in the most conservative state in the country by many, many measures. And Houston, just this summer, overhauled their bus network to make it more frequent, increasing the number of people who have access to it. Here's a side story on that. That was actually done by a Portland consultant, Jarrett Walker, who really learned his trade when Portland did the same thing in 1984. So Portland did it in 1984, Houston's doing it in 2015. That's what, 30, 31 years difference. But the point is, they're catching up. The interesting thing to me, too, is encountering Portland people like Jarrett working elsewhere around the country and taking these lessons around the country. There's a little bit of bittersweetness to it, though. I ran into somebody I know works for one of the construction companies here. We were at a national conference in some, some other place. We said, how's it going? He said, it's, he said, it's going great. I'm busier than ever. It's really, really terrific. Business has never, never been better. I said, well, what, what are you working on? He said, well, it's kind of funny. You know, we're, we're kind of closing up our work on the Orange Line now. And when we do that, it's going to be the first time in 20 years I haven't had work in Portland. But every Monday morning, I'm at PDX getting on a plane to, to Los Angeles, and I come home on Friday afternoon. So I'm really busy, but I'm in another city. I ran into somebody this week I used to work with here at Metro, specializes in environmental impact statements for, for transit projects, and she's doing that now in Seattle. Let me finish the Seattle story, because this one sticks in my craw, and I know it's really good Randy Miller is not here because he'd have an aneurysm, knowing how Randy Miller feels about Seattle. But Seattle, we remember, we always used to make fun of it, you know, that they would never get their act together on transportation. They could have Major League Baseball, and they could have uh, Mount Rainier could be a little bigger than Mount Hood, that's okay, but transportation, right, we had it, we had that locked down. Well, they're gonna open the line that now goes from the uh, airport to downtown. They're gonna extend that to the University of Washington and Capitol Hill in March. Those two stations, that'll double their ridership because of those destinations. University of Washington, which is now 25, to an, 25 minutes to an hour from downtown, will suddenly be 11 minutes from downtown. They're gonna start construction on the line from Bellevue across the lake. They have on the ballot for next fall a sound transit expansion measure of $15 billion more. Now this is the governance piece of this, and this is what's happening up there, because it's not just that regional level, important as that is, there's also coordinated activity happening at the county and the city level where they're all on the same page. Seattle Metro is run by King County, one unit of government. The biggest user of it is people who live in Seattle, different entity. Now the city of Seattle passed their own measure to supplement the budget of King County Metro by $50 million a year to improve the transit service in the city. They're in fact buying service. There's kind of an element of competition in that in that they could uh, maybe procure those services someplace else. And they're using really sophisticated metrics to decide what it is they want to buy. One of those metrics is they're going to keep measuring what percentage of the population is within a quarter mile of a bus that runs at least every 10 minutes. Now, that's a very user-based type of metric as opposed to the metric that we've sometimes used that are about our own operations as opposed to our benefits to the, to the public. City of, city of Seattle also next month will have a, a measure on the ballot for city streets, improving those for biking and walking. That's to the tune of $930 million, over, over, over 10 years, $93 million a year over the next 10 years. Tremendous amount happening there. But to top it off, there's also the state government up there. This summer they increased their gas tax 11.9 cents a gallon 
That is a 30% increase in their gas tax, just 175 miles up the road here. This is also happening in other places. Again, it's not red, it's not blue. States like Vermont also increased their gas tax. Pretty liberal place, but so did the state of Wyoming. So wherever there's a value proposition, people believe in these investments, they're improving them. There's this wave of investment going across the country. People are figuring out that Dwight Eisenhower is not gonna be reincarnated. Uh, even if he were, he wouldn't win the Republican primary. And the federal government is not likely to be the partner that it's been over the last 40 or 50 years, and places are having to figure this out on their own. Now, Portland used to be leading the parade on figuring this stuff and kind of going against the grain and doing things before everybody else. And now, in some senses, and this is, again, the tough love part, take it that way, please, is doing a little bit of watching the parade go by while there's some wheel spinning here. But you have to ask why and have to ask why in a governance sense, you know, are there systemic reasons for that? Now in City Hall here, it's been gripped for the last two or three years about a debate about whether or not there's gonna be a street fee to maintain the streets in, in good condition. Now think about that in comparison. The people in Seattle, people in Denver, people in Los Angeles, they're actually planning how they're gonna improve streets. They're figuring out which one to go first. Is it gonna be Arapahoe? Is it gonna be Colfax? Is it gonna be Crenshaw Boulevard in LA? They're, they're, they're doing that. And the debate here is not about improving, but just, well, can we keep things from getting worse? And even that's an open question. Now, I know there's a lot of optics around that and reasons for it, and we, we, can, we can get into that, but it's a sad thing. Now, in Salem, while up the road in Olympia, they were raising the gas tax by 30%, the legislature here chose not to do that, chose not to, to fund transportation. And again, there are a lot of reasons. I'm 3,000 miles away. I can't speak to exactly why that is. But certainly, it didn't help that at the last minute it came out that the state the transportation department had been promoting figures about greenhouse gas emissions that were wildly exaggerated, had no credibility at all. Now, it's polite, everybody, it's Oregon, so every, everybody's polite, it's chalked up, well, it's a mistake, everybody does make mistakes, and that's certainly understandable. But you have to ask when mistakes become chronic, when inaccuracy in forecasts become chronic, is there some systemic reason for that? Is there some institutional reason that needs to be fixed? It's probably not just a matter of lack of facility with mathematics, if these forecasts are continually off. Now, that was the same agency who in 2010, a blue ribbon committee of the experts from around the country said the finance plan for the Columbia River crossing was implausible. And a series of other data errors around that project. Again, a, if it becomes a pattern of inaccuracy, you really need to look behind. It's not simply accidents that are happening. Now I know these things are in the, in the background and, and history's history, certainly in terms of People remember there have been recent city audits that in some senses the city hasn't been perfect with money in terms of the parking, parking meter situation and, 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 the, and the, the findings that in the past money had been promised for maintenance. You know, those are holes that we need to dig out of politically as well as, as, as the literal, literal ones. So these are, this is all part of the backdrop, I think, as the continuing sense that there's a, a crisis in, in transportation. Well, the last time that was said, and this is probably also some of the history of it in Salem, last increases to the state gas tax, 2001, 04, 2009, prompted actually a huge run up in debt, such that ODOT's debt to date, debt service in terms of the state highway fund is now 35% of the, is going to debt service to bondholders rather than to project. That, that's 35% today, that was 2% in 2001. And if you think about what that means in a management sense or in, in the sense of just accounting, or it means that when more revenue was provided, the agency became less likely to live within its means. So there's a little bit of perversity there and makes you wonder, well, do we want more money to go there when it just seems to be not, they're not living within our means? It means the, the, the request of the legislature or the voters are, you know, I know I, you gave me a, a nice allowance last time and I, I, now I, I used it to run up a big credit card bill and I didn't take care of stuff and now I'd like more money. It's not a very persuasive case to most parents of teenagers and it's not very persuasive to voters. But again, this question of performance, is, that, is it a persistent thing? Is it something structural? I think it is. I think there are structural things that you could fix that would solve many of these things. 
the statement that Oregon has a transportation finance problem, you know, I don't know. I don't know how anybody would know. The agencies are so opaque, it's hard to know whether there's truly a finance crisis here or a finance, uh, uh, transportation finance problem. What there definitely is, is a transportation governance and management problem. And that's the thing that needs to be fixed first. Unless that gets fixed first, the crisis will persist. There's some lessons from other places in how places are reforming their, their transportation organization to make them more accountable. And again, this is, this is systemic. Everybody involved in this, uh, most of the folks involved in this situation here are good people, hardworking people. The, the, the city, Portland City Council today, if you could get them to sit down and take an IQ, there's probably the aggregate IQ on that city council is higher, higher than it's ever been. The leaders of both houses in the legislature, really talented, smart, dedicated people and public-minded people. And again, this is coming from somebody who lives in New York, where quite, if you follow this, the Speaker of the House and the Senate President in New York are actually under indictment and, and awaiting trial, no kidding. So to count your blessing here in Oregon, you have public servants that really want to do the right thing, nobody's on the take. I mean, the, the opportunities are there, smart people. You just need the right system. Same for, for the Portland Department of Transportation. Whatever the sins of the past of a few bad apples in the parking meter, it's in the past. 99% of them are doing a great job and they're nationally known for doing it. But again, if good people can't make the system work, then you have to say, well, then there must be something wrong with the system. So here's how some of the reforms are looking. First of all, let me describe how decisions have been made the last 50 years in the world of, of transportation planning, which is primarily for cars. It's been very top-down, very mysterious, very much the oracles of, of the agencies. There's a technical part to it, and then there's a political part to it. The technical part was the priority to is the flow of cars. How many cars can we get to move and how fast can we get them? Based on forecasts that invariably show traffic going up, in the forecast, even though our experience over the last 10 years that is actually going down, but it's always shown to be going up, and with the assumption that cost is no object, because we've been conditioned by an era in which 90% of the money was coming from the federal government. Uh, in fact, I had a planner at, at ODOT saying, well, we're not allowed to consider costs because the federal government won't allow us. Actually, it's not actually true. They are supposed to consider that. But that's been the conditioning. The drawbacks to that approach, one is on the, on the capacity issue, it doesn't account for induced demand, that as you build more space, it fills up with more cars. And the forecasts, the drawback with those, I said that they tend to be overstated almost every time, and the fact is funds are limited. That's the technical part of how it's done, the flaws there. There's the political part, too, that we all know, which is legislators who are on particular committees, they have ranking, well, you, you might get an interchange in your district. That's the sort of un unscientific part. So how are other states dealing with this? Let me tell you about Massachusetts. Massachusetts in 2013 raised the gas tax and they raised $600 million a year for transportation. And Deval Patrick, the governor at the time, really went to bat for that. The only way he could get the legislature to agree to that in 2013 is he started in 2009 and said, I need to shake up the transportation agencies. In fact, I need to blow it up. They had been dug by the big dig. There were cost overruns, forecasting errors, all, all kinds of things. Public credibility, very, very low. He overhauled, he brought in, he cleaned house, brought in new management, but then they also changed the structure. He and the legislature went to statute and changed the structure. There were three key reforms. One was, instead of having project selection done strictly on the basis of alleviating traffic congestion, which is a fool's errand, they started, they were gonna evaluate projects in terms of economic impact, social impact, environmental impact. Secondly, they were gonna have an independent board, an independent board not in the transportation department, but an independent board charged with the fiduciary integrity of the state to evaluate all of those claims. And then third, they also recognized, you know what, Western Massachusetts is different. The rural area is different. We're not gonna have a statewide package that suits Beacon Hill or Back Bay in Boston and also Pittsfield, and they separate it that way. Pennsylvania, that same year, Republican governor, Pennsylvania, $2.3 billion a year increase. Really significant thing here in terms of governance. Again, transit in the state of Pennsylvania is a local concern, just like it is in Oregon. But Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, they've been on their own in terms of generating their own revenue for transit. 
In this bill in 2018, 2013, for the first time, state money went to those transit agencies in Philadelphia and, and Pittsburgh, because the state legislature recognized, you know, I am a state legislator, but my job is not only to the state government, it's to the people in the state and in my district, and so money went to transit. It was just a calculation that said, you know, this state has an income tax, and if Philadelphia and Pittsburgh aren't mobile, the state is Appalachia. That's what they have, and so that's why they invested in mobility for those cities. They also increased the money going to local streets, recognize that's where most of the trips are, but they conditioned some of it on competitive grants that localities had to apply and not just say, well, we're gonna alleviate traffic. California is probably the best case where delegating authority to, to metropolitan regions, a large slug of money was taken that had been spent by the California Department of Transportation was delegated to the metropolitan planning organizations in the, in the large districts of the state, the Bay Area, Southern California, and so on. It came with strings from the state, and the state set high standards for spending it in ways that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions, help the economy, connect people with jobs, other types of performance measures. So in summary, all of these places, none of them just put money into the same old formula, the same old system, the same old agencies. All of them delegated more money to the local level. All of them recognized that urban and rural are different. All of them got a lot more careful about project, pro, project selection and evaluation and using clear criteria and out standards. Now, while they're implementing reforms, frankly, I haven't seen as much of that here at the state level. Oregon is not a leader in that. The bill that didn't pass in the 2015 legislature was actually pretty much old school. A lot of big road widening at the edge of town, shortchanging local maintenance, no real institutional reform, no performance measures really to speak of, some key projects for key legislators if they vote in the right way. Well, that's the way things used to be done, but it's not the way it should be done anymore. These things have a cost. They really do have a cost. Flawed, flawed governance leads to poor decision making, it leads to irrational priority setting, and it wastes money. Let me just give you a, a few examples. The Ross Island Bridge was renovated in the early 2000s because it's owned by the state government. And the Selwood Bridge, far worse condition, languished for years because it happens to be owned by a local government. And even when that local government, and bless their hearts, I mean, imagine you're elected to the county commission, right? And, and you think you're going to deal with jails and, and health clinics, and suddenly you have this big engineering and planning problem. Bless them for doing it. But the solution requires that people in Troutdale, who are 25 miles away, very unlikely to use the bridge, are gonna be paying for it for 20 years. People in Milwaukee and Lake Oswego who use it every day won't pay at all. So there's these inequities in, 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 the, in the system. There's also this inability for people to know who's responsible for, for what. There's a, there's a growing tendency toward more accountability in these systems to build. The pinnacle of that is probably Transport for London, where they've created an agency in 2000 that manages the transit as well as 9,200 miles of arterials, as well as the bike share, as well as the car share, the, the bus lines, some of which they're competitively contracting out. They've got contactless payment. They're doing all these competitive things, and they've had tremendous real estate growth as a result of transit investments, places like King's Cross. So if you have a bad experience on the tube, you know who's responsible. It's Transport for London, it's the mayor. If you have a bad experience with the taxi, that's you complain to Transport for London, it's the mayor's responsibility. If you don't like it, don't vote for him next time. And if the bus is late, that's his, his fault too. If you come across a pothole, no question who's responsible for that, it's Transport for London, it's the mayor. People know who they call. Now imagine this pothole here, where, if, if I'm driving across the bridge, so it, I guess that's, uh, I guess it's the county who, like I say, they're busy running the, the jails. Now, it's probably the mayor, though, because I remember he ran a campaign about potholes. So, um, it, but actually, no, it's the commissioner who doesn't even work for him who didn't campaign about potholes. So the accountability is a little, little fuzzy there. Now, if I, maybe I drove for three blocks on Barber Boulevard or on Powell Boulevard. Well, that's, that's owned by the state, so that must be the governor's pothole. But you think, well, now, why, is the, why would the governor of a state, who's got the whole state to worry about, care about a pothole on a local street? Is that really the right official to be responsible for that? A lot of, lot of lack of clarity. So the basic problems in, in Oregon that I think need to be fixed in terms of government are, are pretty simple. 
One is this mashup of ownerships where cities, counties, and the state all own pieces of road in the metropolitan area. That's one. The second is the totally random allocation of funding. So as you know, the primary funding goes 50 of the gas tax and related funds. 50% to the state, 30% to counties, 20% to cities. So you think, well, there must be, Oregon benchmarks everything. There must be some reason for that. Actually, there, there really isn't. It has nothing to do with mileage. It has nothing to do with need. It has nothing to do with return on investment. It's just sort of always been that way. So the two simple things that need to be happened to fix that, one is deciding who's gonna be responsible for what, and secondly, then just holding them responsible to do it and award the funding accordingly. It sounds simple, I know. I know organizational change is really, really hard. Reorganizing the solid waste department at Metro is like rewriting the tr Treaty of Ghent or something. So, so reorganizing transportation, it's not to be taken lightly. Ask Governor Patrick in, in Massachusetts, it's not easy. So on deciding who's gonna do what, there's some basic principles. Jarrett Walker, the transit consultant, you, it's, all, it's never gonna be a seamless system, but you can figure out where the seams are, where they make sense. And we do that in other systems that are multi-layered. The insanity of Oregon's transportation governance system can be illustrated by another, an opposite, but very similar. Oregon's criminal justice system, pretty, pretty complex topic. But it's crystal clear who does what. The state sets statutes, Murder in Baker City is murder in Bedford, murder in Portland's all the same. There's a certain standard. And if you have a sentence of more than a year, you're going to state penitentiary. And counties run jails. If your sentence is up to a year, you're going to be in a county jail. Cities run police departments. They each have their own specialty. They each reinforce each other. None of them are in none of them are better than the other. They're all indispensable. The point is they're solving the problem at the level where it's most competently solved based on geography, based on the resources, based on the accountability. That's sort of a watchword from, called subsidiarity that the European Union decides, uses to decide what will be done by the EU and what will be done by the, the member states. So erase the boundaries on all this ownership. It drove me nuts when it hears staff say, oh, well, that's an ODOT road, that's a PBOT road. It's all our roads, it's taxpayers' roads. Then we ought to say that. But the second piece of that then is to spend the money on the things that really count. Now, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but it's gotta be some kind of merit-based, competitive type of process rather than an annuity or guarantee based on 50%, something based on the value that the, that the public is, is getting. Now, these sound like really wonky things. These are complicated intergovernmental things, but they're really important. Unless you get the governance right, the decisions won't be right, and the money won't be well spent. The real benefits of this are, in the value for money. But there are other benefits too because there are very few of us that actually like transportation just for the sake of transportation. For the rest of us, it's actually a means to something else. It's a means for people to get to work. It's a means for more people in our society to get to more work. It's about the air that we breathe. It's about the neighborhoods that we ought to have. It's about all the things that those activists and mayors that we've talked about, cared about, and worked for. Oregon has been an a leading innovator on all of those things. Great track record of that. And the evidence, the evidence is all around you. Take a look. Pioneer Courthouse Square. There's Cooper Mountain. It's 260 acres on the south slope of Cooper Mountain near Beaverton, preserved by Metro and the voters. If on a day like this, you can see across the Tualatin River to the, to the Coast Range, all you'll hear is the hawks. That's, that's pretty special. The so waterfront that could still be a brownfield, and in some other cities might have been turned into a football stadium to be used eight times a year and empty, 357. Instead, there's world-class scientists doing cancer research and a neighborhood that has some of the most expensive housing and some of the most affordable housing right there in that neighborhood. The buildings along Division, the new shops. Now, does that cause some heartache about parking and change? You bet, of course it does. But you know, these are all choices. And isn't that scene out there, whether you don't like fedoras or hipsters or the baby strollers, isn't that better than the empty grocery store or the porno theater that used to be there? Or more to the point, what we're talking about today, isn't it better than the six lane trench highway that was once proposed to be there? You know, these things are all choices. They're not just places, they're choices. And Oregon's got a great record of making the right choices. So look at those things, don't take them for granted. They didn't happen by accident. 
They happened because people cared. They happened because people like you and me stood up, said we think things could be different. We care about this place. People agitated, other people invested, other people proposed ideas that seemed crazy at the time and are now being emulated nationally. So ultimately, that's the edge here. It's the people. Some of the people who did that are in this room today. There are others who've passed away who are not here, but we remember. There are others who are in this room that are probably grandchildren of people who did those things. That's really the legacy I want you to grasp. I expect a lot from you. Don't let me down. If you're just tuning in on OPB, I'm Sarah Merck. I'm here with David Bragdon. We're at the City Club Friday Forum, and we're talking about transportation. Hi, David. It's good to have you back in Portland. Good to be here. Um, I want to talk about the human impact of transportation spending. And you talked about how other cities um, are taking the streets back for people versus Oregon's totally random allocation of money on transportation spending. Uh, that's what you said. So, I'm wondering, how should we change the way that we value transportation projects? How should we change the way that we decide what transportation projects are worth spending money on so that we prioritize those projects that people actually want and need now versus what people decided we needed 50 years ago, which were mostly car-centric freeway projects? Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of discipline going into this now, and there's no right answer to it. In fact, we're funding some, some research that, a, that a, a couple of organizations are really looking at. How do you make decisions based on the performance and the life cycle asset, you know, the life cycle of the, of the asset? And I think the, the important part is expanding the criteria that you're using. You're no longer, the sole measure is not how many cars you can move, which literally that was the measure. It's called, you know, level of service, volume over capacity, V over C. And adopting other measures in terms of economic impact, what freight, freight mobility, the, the environmental impacts. I think California is probably in the lead of, of figuring that out. Um, it, it definitely is more subjective, but it's the right types of value judgments that policymakers ought to be making, uh, as opposed to, to horse trading or just sort of letting a formula run on decade after decade. So instead of determining the value of a transportation project based on expanding car capacity, looking at other things like the environmental impact. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and they've been doing that in the Bay Area. It actually really changed the list of, including transit projects. You know, tell you the truth. I mean, because not all transit projects, you know, I think if we'd had that, I mean, the, you know, that's uh, the same type of discipline. It's not all about, you know, ending road projects. It's about getting better road projects, but also better transit projects. And how do you think that would change life for the average Oregonian? How, would it, how does it change a city or state to invest more heavily in public transit, biking and walking, than the old freeway models? Well, you know, I think the economic change is happening in the country and what's happening with, with household budgets. That for, for most people, transportation is the second biggest part of their, their household budget. And if you are devoting a large share of that to automobile ownership, just your ownership, first of all, it's, you're owning an asset that depreciates the minute you buy it, and then you're, you're paying to insure it, and a lot of people you're having it sit 22, 23 hours a day, that, that, that can be a pretty big hit. And this, some of this has been quantified by the Center for Neighborhood Technology in, in Chicago, that if you're not burdened with car ownership, you have more disposable income for, for, for other things. So certainly that's an economic benefit. I think the ability to have the freedom to move around and get to more potential employers, that's an economic benefit. The ability of people who, for reasons of age, young or old, uh, don't drive or shouldn't be driving, the ability for them to have freedom of movement around a city and, and really be explore the city, and for parents of those young people to not be sentenced to life as a chauffeur for their, you know, for their children's uh, childhood. I mean, I think there are a number of benefits, and that's all quantified by the fact that the real estate market across the country, including in Portland, is saying people want the types of neighborhood that are walkable and have have transit. So there's clearly a market for it, but this is like a lot of other things where the people and the market is way ahead of the policymaker, particularly at the federal level, in the sense that transit ridership is up, the demand for new projects is up, and, and Congress is cutting those, uh, those, those funds. 
So the, you know, the experience on the ground, the, the demographic changes, and we documented some of this in public opinion research, it's really moving that way. Well, so, yeah, so it sounds like those economic benefits that you just mentioned that are all super important for the average person aren't always factored into our transportation planning or our, our understanding of the economic impact of transportation projects. Yeah, right, so, they haven't been, mm -hmm. but they are increasingly in some places. So as somebody you used to live here in Portland, you grew up here, and then uh, you now live in New York, um, and also sort of grew up there. <laughs> um, when you lived here, did you have to own a car, and do you have to own a car now in New York? Well, I think one of the interesting things that's happening is this emergence of other forms of shared mobility that are not transit, but that are not privately operated and owned. And uh, well, I'll answer your personal question. Yes, yeah, some of the time here I owned a car, but it sat in the garage a lot of the time. You know, and I, it always drove me a little crazy because you know you write just writing the check for insurance. I'm paying seven hundred dollars a year or whatever it was just to insure something that was sitting six days a week. But I needed that to be able to go do grocery shopping, or there might be something I'd be going out at, at night and use it once or twice a week. These these the the emergence of Network companies like Lyft, which are really just taxis, but enabled by, you know, they're demand responsive. Um, bike sharing, car sharing, and just the rise of biking uh, on your own. I think the net effect of a lot of those things is it, it enables one to live a life free of car ownership. I was one, and I think there are many people who, who own a car, but only for certain types of trips because there was no other way to accomplish those trips, like going to the grocery store once a week or something. With the availability of some of these other services, being able to not own a car becomes a lot more practical. That's why we think things like Lyft are actually a supplement and a good, good extender to a transit system rather than a competitor. Um, yeah, so your talk brought up sort of two messages that um, can kind of feel like they're at odds with each other, but they work together, that we both need to, that there's a fallacy around just needing to put more money into our transportation system, that while other cities are putting in more money into exciting projects like Denver, Seattle, Los Angeles are all putting in more money into public transit systems, you're saying that in Oregon we both need to better use our money and better uh, figure out where our current existing money goes, and once we figure out those better systems, we can invest uh, more into public transit. Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I mean, they're federal, the state, state funds are a little more restricted because of the gas tax restriction. They're federal funds that are more flexible. If there was more competition around those and, and they weren't sort of automatically kept by the state, there, there would be an opportunity for communities around the state to be able to compete with those, uh, compete, compete for those. I guess what I'm saying is that there shouldn't be a, a, an annuity or a guarantee, an entitlement, based on just sort of jurisdictional ownership of the past. And again, you know, try to relate this to another field that, you know, because if we said, okay, the criminal justice system, we went and asked the head of the corrections department, how should we spend money? I, I assume he's going to go to bat for his aid. He ought to, you know, take care. He's going to say, well, we should have 50% spent on penitentiaries, 30% sent to county jails, and 20% sent to police departments, you know, because that's the formula for transport. You've got to make sense for criminal justice, too, right? Not, not logical? You know, there, the, Oregon has overhauled higher education, but if there were still a higher education department and, and you went to a, a board and you went, well, how should we spend money on education? They'd say, well, 50% to universities, 30% to community colleges, 20% to K through 12, right? Because that's how transportation does it. Got to make sense, right? But we'd say that's crazy. I think the, it's the schizophrenic and conflicted role that the state government plays is the and this, again, this is a systemic comment. It's not, you know, it, it, it's, it, it has nothing to do with personalities. It's that a state can be a regulator of local government, it can be a conduit of funds to local government, and in some senses it can compete with, but it can't do all three legitimately. You can't be a contestant and a judge at the same time. Uh, I'm trying to think of other, I mean, think of the Department of Environmental, the sewage system that DEQ regulates local government's discharge. Now imagine if DEQ was also running a few random sewage treatment plants, you know, in competition. That that's what's crazy about this patchwork that the state government owns 82nd Avenue, 
or, or Powell Boulevard, there's really no state interest in that. It needs to be managed cohesively. So when you say entitlements based on um, jurisdictional priorities of the past, you mean basically making decisions based on the status quo. So just because we've been funding these things this way doesn't mean we need to keep funding things this way and we need to f figure out better systems of funding those or what we should be funding. Right, right. It's all our money. I mean, that, I think that, that these things get treated as if they're etched in stone or it's a product of history and, and, and uh, the city of Milwaukee can't have a stoplight on McLaughlin Boulevard so that people can get from downtown to Milwaukee to the park across the street because after all, that's actually not McLaughlin Boulevard, that's Highway 99 and before I-5 was built in 1965, that was the way to get to Salem. So because people took that route from Portland to Salem 50 years ago, the city of Milwaukee can't have a traffic light where that community wants to have a traffic light, it is just crazy. I just want to briefly ask about TriMet, and then we'll go to Q&A from the, the crowd, um, which is, so you uh, helped, you, you used to be the president of Metro um, and have a lot of experience with TriMet here in the city, and so I'm wondering, how have you seen TriMet change over time here, and what can we do now to make TriMet more equitable, just, just on a local level? Well, you know, I think in terms of equity, I mean, I think that, um, that, that that we get a, a lot, Portland gets a lot of notice for the rail system, rightly so, but in, in many cities, including London, I mean, London has twice as many bus passengers as tube passengers, and uh, that, that the, the importance of the bus system shouldn't be understated. There are ways to speed up buses. We're doing some work on that around, around the country, some emphasis on that. You mentioned equity, too, and I think having that as a way of making capital investment decisions would, would actually have changed some decisions in the past. The, Wilsonville to Beaverton commuter rail, $160 million, carries 1,500 people a day, most of them you know, higher than average income relative to the transit riding population. Division, Division Street Fessenden bus 18,000 people a day, and we're only now starting to think about, well, how can we help those 18,000 people? They are not of the same you know, economic. So you know, I think if you looked at those investments, uh, which, you know, this is again, it's history, but it's a lesson from the history. You might say, you know what, those 18,000 people deserve the type, you know, deserve real attention. If you're just tuning in OPB, I'm Sarah Merck. I'm here with David Bragdon at City Club's Friday Forum. We're talking about transportation. And we're going to take a question from uh, the crowd. Uh, here's your special reminder. Hang on. It, it ends with a question mark. That's one of the, that's a, that's a Jim Zarin. Okay, caution. we're going to have to, uh, if you have a question right on an index card, please hold it up high so that the City Club staff can see it and collect it from you. Um, as always, uh, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions to the Friday Forum microphone is a benefit of City Club membership. Membership is open to everyone. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your questions in 30 seconds or less. Also, I will read one index card question that somebody will bring to me. Thanks. Let's go to the microphone. Hi, uh, my name is Kennedy Bertelson. I'm here as one of these civic scholars. Uh, I know that the city just spent upwards of a billion dollars on the new max line and just set aside eight million to work on uh, improving 122nd. While I understand the city's desire to make large and noticeable changes to make wide scale transportation easier and more accessible, I'm concerned that the city is spending around like all that money and then specifically around eight million dollars on a street that is functioning without major problems when the streets surrounding 122nd don't even have sidewalks. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my, my thoughts are that the, you know, the transportation field has been dominated by consideration of large projects. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're considered really dramatic and, and, and sexy. And that what's increasingly the case is that these finer grained changes, when multiplied over the you know, the scale of a city or a nation are really, really very significant. And that those are the types of systemic changes that, that come about when you think about spending money differently and actually do some analysis of who's going to be impacted the most. I mean, it, it, it's, it's like my earlier comment about the, the bus system. I know, you know, 122nd is, is dangerous. I know that Commissioner Novick and others have really committed themselves to make that safer. Um, I can't speak to the exact trade-off of that street relative to the others that you mentioned, but I know there's a lot that needs to be done there. Wait, you mentioned finer grain changes. Can you explain what that means? Well, I mean, they, that um, 
for for example, saying, well, we're we're going to do more with with crosswalks, but we're going to do them all over the place. And I think I think that a small intervention repeated over and over systemically across the landscape can be very significant. So investing a little bit of money in things in small projects like a, a few crosswalks, a few sidewalks versus big sexy projects. Yeah, and not confusing jurisdictional size with importance. You know, and, and there's a, there's another fallacy going around in, in the world of trend about what's of statewide significance, right? And so there's an assumption that has to do with length or size and that um, you know, uh, Bend to Vail, you know, across I I uh, uh, Eastern Oregon, that that's of statewide significance because it's very long. In, in terms of actual demand and number of people, I'm not saying this to slight the need for there to be a good highway there. I'm just saying that that alone may not be as economically significant as 18,000 people who each ride the bus two miles along Division Street, because the 18,000 people, even though they're only going two miles, that's, that's an enormous impact in terms of uh, demand on the system and greenhouse gas conservation and, and, and those sorts of things. So I think taking this more systemic view and saying, well, even though bus service seems really prosaic and local, collectively, it has a huge impact. Cool, let's take another question. Uh, I have a city called member, Jim Zern. Um, David, I want to, uh, you respond quick to two questions. First one is, uh, I want to know how you'd react if we had the legislature pass a bond and endow it for the David Bragdon uh, Transportation Czar of Oregon. Would you accept? No, I, I, you know, I've got a great job right now. But if, if they want to do a travel fund so that I could come here more often, uh, I would definitely go for that. How, how much, no how conflict much, of interest. How much would it take then? Yeah. <laughs> uh, second question is, um, you, you gave us about five or 10 seconds on the Columbia Crossing, but I wanted to ask you to comment on that. I mean, you've been gone five years. I think during that time, it, that whole issue kind of arose and was decided, at least temporarily decided, we think. Um, but using all the examples that you've used and the perspective that you've got, and you have been around the block, so to speak, um, we were gonna spend, what, three to four billion dollars, 90% of which was gonna be uh, federally funded. It was going to be this huge project, sexy as you say, uh, tremendous number of jobs in the midst of a depression, almost, and we couldn't do it. What does that say about our system and our governance? I, it, is, it is exactly a governance issue. It's interesting, I, I wondered if that would come up because everybody's so polite and, and it's such a huge issue and I think ignoring it is to you know, risk repeating similar mistakes. And, when you have $200 million spent and a failure of that magnitude, it really does behoove us to actually look at what happened. Now, there were certainly a lot of engineering mistakes, a lot of forecasting mistakes, a lot of you know, permitting mistakes with the coast. I mean, the list goes on. And all of those are on ODOT. You know, ODOT, the, the director puffed himself up and said, this is ours, this is ours, this is ours, we're in charge. You know, and then everything falls apart and suddenly it's everybody else's responsibility. So, the, and the current spin on it, and there was so much spin about this that again, some real serious analysis ought to be done. Because the current spin is a bunch of, uh, three or four right wingers in the Washington legislature killed this thing that otherwise was nirvana and beautiful. Well, you know, you know, Dexter, Dexter Fowler in the, on the Cubs the other night, right? So he struck out to make the last out. It was the last that ended the Cubs season. So to say three right wingers in Olympia killed the Columbia River Crossing, like saying Dexter Fowler destroyed the Cubs season, right? There were 26 outs before that and there were 162 games before that. The Columbia River Crossing died because of a series of errors and inaccuracies and half-truths at best at the highest levels in Salem. I mean, that's the story of it. It was, it was a zombie. Say the Washington legislature had done something. Fact is, this is also part of the spin, the Oregon legislature didn't actually appropriate a dime. You know, that was more clever optics. They passed a bill saying they would, right? And you mentioned 90% federal are you living in the 1950s? There's no 90% federal, met, especially the Republican member of Congress from the district is opposed to, you think the Republican Congress is gonna give 90% to a project that the 
that the member of Congress from that district didn't want. So there, there's, there's all this mythology around it. Now, where do you go from here? I mean, I think, and I think it is a failure of governance. I think the thing was doomed when it got assigned unilaterally to the highway divisions. When you took an urban, complex, multimodal project and give it to agencies that are not urban, not locally accountable, unimodal, you know, they built overpasses here and there. But, you know, and again, that expertise does exist in the, in the region. I think that's the solution. Uh, you, you, between TriMet, which has delivered projects in really, in terms of community relations, I mean, they worked with downtown Gresham, Hillsborough, Milwaukee. They dealt with difficult communities, but they did it in an inclusive way that, that ODOT and Washtenaw just, it's just not in their DNA, partly because, you know, they're more distant. You know, they're not accountable to us. So I think, you know, if you had some, a working group of the transit agencies, the cities, there was actually a really good working relationship among the local officials. And, and if you could leverage that, maybe the two port authorities, again, the Port of Portland, I mean, my God, you know, more than 100 years of really good project delivery. Anybody who knows about freight mobility, they know it. In terms of engineering projects that are delivered, in terms of dealing with the core, you know, they wouldn't have neglected to talk to the Coast Guard about building a bridge across the second longest navigable waterway in the United States. Like, oh, we forgot to talk to the, you know. So there is a lot of competence in this region. That competence was not put in play on that project. And instead it was done in this top-down, you know, command and control from Salem and Olympia. And that is what doomed it. To follow up on that, another sort of baseball question. Um, what if despite all that, what if despite the fact that there are all these other outs, the last guy, I don't remember what the situation was, but what if it had been a grand slam and they'd have won? Meaning, what if despite all that, we'd have built the damn thing? And when it's all built and we spent all that money, it turned out, like so many people have pointed out, that we may have done a lot about the bridge and immediately around the bridge, but gee, there's this problem down by the Rose Garden, or what's it called now, Moda Center, that we wouldn't have done anything about it. You have a comment about how that might have turned out? That, that, that's one of many technical flaws that they continually stonewalled and either through incompetence or dishonesty at the highest levels of ODOT just refused to, to acknowledge. So you say, well, what if the right-wingers in the legislature in Olympia had let it happen? And the spin, oh, well, now it would be under construction. Well, you know, the, the, the finance plan did not add up. The EIS had holes in it. I mean, where, where, where you'd be right now is probably in federal court, actually. I know, seriously. And again, like TriMet's never had a successful appeal you know, against them. So these things can be done. There is expertise in the region to do it. Um, I think where you'd actually be right now is ODOT and Washtop would be back at their legislatures saying, oh, you know what, we miscalculated. You know, there's gonna, it's gonna be a little bit more. I know we told you that the federal government's gonna pay, but you know, because you know what's actually happening in Washington. They have not actually passed a meaningful transportation bill really since like 07 or 08, something like that. So, you know, I think if, if, if for some reason it continued lurching on, so, it, you know, it, it's, uh, you know it, it would not be under construction today. You know, it just wasn't, it, it didn't add up. We have only two more minutes left, and it's only fair to read a question from the card, so this is going to be the last question. Um, the subject of higher speed rail seems to have fallen off the radar screen. Will it, should it ever come back? Yeah, I, you know, I think, again, I think that's, that is also that's another illustration of the governance um, issue in that the Obama administration made a big commitment to that $8 million. A lot, now a lot of it has gone to California, and they, you know, they channeled a lot of that through the state governments, but a lot of these corridors, particularly in the Midwest, they run through multiple states. And when you had what was going on in Ohio and Wisconsin with Republican takeover and then turning them, you know, so it's, you know, it, it, it's kind of hard to, um, you know, similar in, in New Jersey. I mean, if, if you have, uh, trying to do something between New York and Philadelphia, and Chris Christie is the governor of the intervening state, you know, it's really hard, hard to do things. So I, I think that's a real challenge in this country is that the corridors, other than California and Texas, really aren't encompassed in any one state. I think incrementally is the way to go. I think that the other mistake I think the administration made is you know, kind of shooting for the moon and saying, you know, we need to go 125, 160 miles an hour or something. I think more reliability, uh, but at more moderate speeds, but having the reliability, I think, 
really can work, and that's been shown to work, and the, the, the Cascades is, uh, you know, is testimony to that. And Washington State was actually very successful in that. They got about $800 million. Oregon got like three or something to put a roof on Union Station because the application wasn't very compelling. But um, again, again, that's, a, you know, it's again, it's, it's sort of a, of a competence issue there. We've run out of broadcast time for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. This is Greg McPherson, president of City Club. Please join me in thanking David Bragdon and Saren Merck, as well as Colin Jones of City Club's Friday Forum Committee who produced this program. We're adjourned. <laughs>